All right, welcome back. Holy cow, there's a lot of pollen today. Um, so, it's been about a week and a half since I finished my subwoofer install, since my last video. But uh, we got some changes we need to make. All right, so in case you haven't seen my last several videos, I've spent probably a good two months, every weekend for the past two months, slowly upgrading the audio system of my Bronco. We have now reached a point where it's effectively a full system replacement. We got all new speakers. We have a new subwoofer that wasn't there from the factory. We got new amplifiers. We got the whole thing, full, full replacement. This past weekend, I went up to Massachusetts for the Bones May It Forward event. A great charity event, by the way. Saw a lot of cool Broncos. Um, but in that 200 to 300 miles of driving, I realized that there is definitely some tweaking I need to do to make this better. Now, don't get me wrong. This is, this is, I mean, this is way better than stock. What I got now is way, way better than stock, but I know I can make it better. So let, let's give it a shot. I don't even know, really know where to begin, to be honest. So I figured I'd just start at the top of the list, the most annoying issue, and work my way down until I'm happy with it. Problem number one these dash speakers are hella loud they are just they they overpower everything else in the sound system when you're sitting up front in this bronco those dash speakers are pretty much the only thing you can hear i don't know what it is i don't know if it's because you know they're literally right where you're sitting and their audio is bouncing off this glass i'm not sure if you sit in the back seat it sounds great like the, the sound system sounds great in the back but in the front seat all you can hear is these dash speakers. So we gotta figure out how to tone those down a little bit. Problem number two, which I'm pretty sure is related to problem number one, is there's no mids in this Bronco. We got the highs thanks to these annoyingly loud dash speakers. We got the lows thanks to the subwoofer that I installed last video, but the mids are not there. I think these kicker, these four inch kickers that I installed, I think they are definitely biased towards the high end. I don't think they're very good at reproducing the mid-range frequencies, but I really would like those mids. Now the kick panels are trying, but it's not enough to overcome what these dash speakers are doing. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, I came up with three ideas. There's probably more. If you have another idea, post it in the description. I would, like I'm kind of grasping at straws if I'm honest with you. I think if I was in a professional audio setting, I think the right answer, I'm not a professional audio guy, just disclaimer. Not a professional audio guy. I can talk about electronics all day long. I've got an electrical engineering degree, but once that electronic enters the real world with speakers, pff, I know nothing. So if I were to guess, the right answer is the DSP. And I think that would solve a lot of my other problems too. The problem is, is that DSPs are expensive. It's gonna be probably 300, 600 bucks for a halfway decent DSP. I don't want to spend that kind of money. There's other stuff I want to buy for this Bronco that's not audio related. So DSP's off the table. Speakers, I think speakers are a good option. It may, it may eventually come to that. I know just from personal experience that the Infinity Reference series speakers as well as the Polk Audio speakers are a lot better at reproducing that mid-range. Um, but again, that's another 80 to 140 bucks depending on what I buy and uh, I, I just don't want to spend the money. So I think we're gonna actually try to remove that base blocker up front, see what that does. So if you go back to my first video where I installed the speakers, you will know that I added 300 Hertz base blockers to the front two dash speakers. The reason why I did that was to help those four inch speakers out. Traditionally, four inch speakers are really bad at producing low ranges. If you add a base blocker, it helps those four inch speakers out a lot, though you'll get a lot more clarity out of them. Uh, the problem is, is in this case, I, I think we got too much clarity. So uh, let's take away the bass blockers and see if that helps. But there's a problem with that. The problem, which I never explained, I don't think anyway, uh, and I probably should have, is that I'm using those bass blockers for another purpose. That kicker key amplifier, that 200.4, if you read the instruction manual, you will know it is a four ohm amplifier. The minimum impedance for that amplifier is four ohms. Those front two speakers, the kick panels and the dash speakers up front, those are wired in parallel, which means the amplifier is actually seeing two ohms. 
uh, that's, that's bad. That could eventually overheat your amplifier. So I was using those bass blockers to help out the amplifier, lower in the frequency range. The lower the frequency, the more power is required to drive the speaker. So by adding a bass blocker, I'm effectively increasing the impedance of the circuit lower in that frequency range, which hopefully would have helped my kicker key from overheating. Now, realistically, if I took away the bass blocker, would I overheat the kicker key tuner dot for? Probably not, honestly. It's probably fine. I'm not using like crazy over the top speakers here. The problem is, is that, and I don't know if you've noticed, but the 200.4, kicker key 200.4 is out of stock everywhere. So I don't know if kicker is discontinuing the amplifier or if they're having trouble with the supply chains. I have no idea. But if I accidentally blow up this amplifier and I have no means to replace it, that's that's gonna suck. So I'm, I wanna avoid that. So I'm actually going to rewire those front speakers in series and see what happens. All right. Where's my bucket? Oh, there it is. Oh, the kids made it muddy. How dare they use my bucket as a bucket? Thanks, children. All right, so we can do this. We can connect these in series fairly easily because it's all connected together by the kick panel speakers in the corner. So these are the same harnesses that I had in the first video for the kick panel speakers. If you remember from my first video, all I said was these are good to go and to wrap them up. When you get them out of the bag, they're connected in parallel, which is exactly how the factory has it connected. But you can actually reconfigure this to wire it in series. So how it works is there's four pins on it. Pin one is positive for the kick panels. Pin four is negative for the kick panels. And pins two and three in the middle are positive and negative for the dash speakers. So you can see the positive lines are just loops. If we ignore these, the positives are just looped and the negatives are just looped. So all we have to do really is take this negative here, move it over to pin two and that's it. So, let's go. So this we actually don't need anymore. I need my butt connectors again. Get my red guy here. So I'll put a wiring diagram on the screen, but how it's working is we got positive coming in from the ACM. It's gonna go to the kick panel speaker. It's gonna come out of the kick panel speaker. The negative is gonna come out of the kick panel speaker and go to the positive on the dash speaker. It'll head up to the dash, go through the positive and negative on the dash, and then the negative will come back out here and then loop right back to the ACM and that'll complete the circuit. So that's how you do that. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and tape this up. Do I have tape? Where did my electrical tape go? There we go. I'm just taping up these loose ends here so they don't accidentally contact anything. There we go. Now wrap the whole thing in cloth tape. So I guess I should explain why we're, why we're doing this. And the reason why is Ohm's law, which is like the foundational equation in all of electronics. It's basically vo voltage equals current times resistance, or in this case, voltage equals current times impedance, because we're dealing with AC, speakers, all AC stuff. And basically what we're doing is by increasing the impedance of the circuit, we are lowering the amount of current that the amplifier has to provide. The lower the current, the less heat is generated, the easier it is for the amplifier to drive it. Hopefully that means we won't overheat the amplifier. So how does the um, parallel versus series thing help with this? Well, if you have two loads in series, their impedance is added together. So if you have two speakers in series, the amplifier will see eight ohms. Four plus four is eight. If you have them hooked together in parallel, it's halved. 
So if you have two four ohm speakers in parallel, the amplifier sees two ohms instead of four ohms, which means it needs to provide more current to drive those speakers. So by hooking them in series, we increase the impedance. If we increase the impedance, we lower the current that's required to drive the speakers, which means we hopefully will stop the 204 from overheating. Again, I don't think it would ever become an issue if we left them in parallel, but you know, hopefully this also solves my other problem of too much highs, not enough mids. Now the downside with this is that this is probably gonna reduce the volume coming out of the front speakers, which may not actually be a downside because those speakers are directly in front of you. And yeah, but if it lowers it too much, there is a gain knob on the 200.4 that we can increase and that will that'll just increase their output so i'm fairly confident this will be okay although the fact that i bought a totally separate set of wiring harnesses for this should give you a hint that maybe i'm not you know 100 percent confident done i'm not going to film this whole process because if you watch my first video you've already seen it but Here's the kick panel speaker. It's held on with three seven millimeter screws. Pop those out, swap the wiring harness over with the new one, pop it back in and you're done. Cool. All right, passenger kick panel done. Got the old wiring harness in case I need to go back, just in case this was a terrible idea. We'll find out. Um, dash speakers. So the one thing different that I didn't have the first time is Metra now has a wiring harness for the dash and the pod speakers in the back. 725603, I'll put the port number down in the description. This wasn't available when I initially installed the dash speakers. I had to buy the adapters from Well Wiring. And to be honest, I was just going to reuse those adapters because they were they worked perfectly fine. But um, I was, you know, like five bucks away from free shipping. So why not? So again, two seven millimeters holding this down. Here's my base blocker that I installed. Out with the old and in with the new. Cool. I'm not going to clip it in because, you know, this could go bad. Driver side. You guys can hang out with Mr. Duck while I do this side. I got this from, uh, I think his online username is Ferris. Yeah, Ferris Bronco is his Instagram name. He's on the Bronco Nation forum. He's probably on Bronco 6G too, I don't know. Nice meeting you though, awesome Bronco. He's got 37s on his Bronco and it looks, it looks real good. I should have taken a picture. Uh, maybe I'll steal a picture from his Instagram, but awesome Bronco, definitely gives me something to work towards. Cool. Okay, at this point I've swapped everything out except for this kick panel harness down here. And the reason why is I wanna pull out the amplifier so I can show you the impedance that the amplifier sees. Oh, nope, that's an eight millimeter apparently. So this harness right here is the inputs from the ACM to the amplifier. This side is our outputs. So it should be uh, pod, pod, front, front. So if we check, if we check the pods, the pods in the back should be four ohms because there's only one speaker back there. There you go, 4.4 ohms. The other one should also be 4.4 ohms. And it is 4.5. This one should be the passenger front, which we should expect somewhere close to 8 ohms because I swapped that harness. 7.5. Cool. Now this, this last one is the driver's side, which I haven't swapped yet. And we're expecting this to be closer to 2. 2.5. So there you go. So it works. We just got to wear them in series, increase the impedance. All right. So speakers are in. I checked everything with the multimeter. We're at 8 ohms. We're good to go. 
Now I'm gonna have to run this kicker auto setup again. And the reason why is because I changed my speaker configs. Anytime you change it, you're gonna have to run the kicker auto setup again. I did that back in my force game video if you wanna see that. All right, let me go find this microphone and then we'll, we'll get it done. Woo! All right, I found the mids. Awesome. Oh man, I'll be back. All right, so it's not, it's not perfect. At higher volumes, these rear pod speakers start clipping, which, you know, is kind of to be expected. But in terms of like reducing the, the crazy power of these front two dash speakers, mission accomplished. In terms of getting your mids, mission accomplished. Um, so we still got these pods to work on. I think I'm gonna be able to solve that maybe by putting base blockers on the rear pods. I don't know, but first, first we're gonna have to solve this subwoofer because this subwoofer is, is really sloppy sounding right now. So, uh, yeah, but we'll have to solve that another day. I gotta go earn a paycheck. Morning. So today's actually Monday, and I did work on my Bronco yesterday during the weekend. I did a bunch of stuff actually, but I didn't feel like filming any of it, so so I didn't. Um, but. Let me catch you up. So we have reached the point where we're putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. Got the wire all tied down in the tray. This is the power in the remote wire, by the way, down the driver's side. It's all right here. Runs all the way back. I did have to pull out this trim piece a little bit. You're not gonna be able to see back there because it's gonna be too dark. But the wire does run back there, pops out down here, and then runs across. It's right here. I haven't tied it to this bar yet but that'll be coming. I did the same thing for all the other wires. So we got the ground wire right there, that's all tied in. The signal wire for, this, for the subwoofer itself, that's all tied in, all zip tied. Just follows the existing cable path. Right here, this, these loops right here, that's the, the signal wire that comes up front from the ACM, that's all tied in. There is like a, probably about a foot and a half extra on this harness, so I just looped it up. And that's pretty much it. So the wiring, the wiring is basically done. The other thing I did yesterday was seal up this subwoofer enclosure. So if you remember from my subwoofer video, I mentioned that there were some holes because I cut off too much plastic when I made that thing. Um, so what I did is I took some silicon, normal GE 100% all-purpose silicon, same stuff you use on your bathrooms, your windows, your doors, attics, all that stuff and mass it off like you would with any bathtub. Seal it up, let it cure. It should be cured now. So we're ready to plug this back in and see if that helped. Before I dig into this subwoofer business, you should know that there is a lot of passion out there around subwoofers. There are people that dedicate all of their free time to designing subwoofer systems and cars, making it sound great. They build their own enclosure boxes. They fine tune their own amplifiers. It's like, it gets real deep. It's within the car audio realm. There is an entire subculture within the car audio realm that, that really, really loves their subwoofers. I'm not that person. So there's going to be a lot of good enough in this video. I'm gonna glance over a lot of the complexities. I'm not even gonna worry about things like SPL. I'm, I'm just gonna stick with the basics. The goal here is to make it sound decent and not blow up the sub in the process. But if you are somebody that really knows their stuff when it comes to subwoofers, please comment below. I'd be curious to know what you think about this. All right, let's go. So when it comes to subwoofer enclosures, there is two main types. The first is a sealed enclosure, which, as the name suggests, is an enclosure that is completely sealed from the outside air. The other is a ported enclosure, which has a port to allow air in and out of the subwoofer box. This B&O sub enclosure here happens to be a ported enclosure. There is a port on the bottom here to allow air in and out of the subwoofer enclosure. These different subwoofer enclosures have different characteristics to them. Um, like a sealed enclosure, for example, is a lot more accurate sounding. It's more tight, I guess I would describe it. A ported enclosure is a lot more airy. Airy is kind of a bad word. It has a lot more resonance. Um, it, you can make it sound a lot better. I, I personally prefer ported enclosures. You're welcome to, you know, Google this to your heart's content on sealed versus ported enclosures. 
for the purposes of this conversation, the thing that we're worried about is the size of the enclosure and the tuning frequency. One of the big benefits of a sealed enclosure is the volume of the enclosure itself, the physical size of the enclosure, can be a lot smaller and it would still sound halfway decent. Obviously that is a huge benefit for car audio where space is a premium. Ported enclosures generally need more volume for it to sound good. Obviously this B&O enclosure over here is pretty small, so the fact that B&O designed a ported enclosure in such a small volume, that's, they must have put a fair amount of engineering work into that. But I don't even know if the volume of this enclosure is big enough for the kicker subwoofer that I put in there. So on Kicker's website, they have minimum and maximum recommended volumes for both sealed and ported enclosures. So let's go ahead and measure this enclosure and see if it is anywhere close to Kicker's recommendations. Now, obviously this thing is goofy. Like, look at this thing. There's no way I'm gonna be able to get an accurate volume measurement. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a bit of guesstimating here to see if I can just get a rough ballpark. See if we're even close to the range. So let's do 30, 26 we'll say by another 26. Mathematics this out, we got 0, 18, 0. What am I doing? I have like a phone right in front of me here. So 30 times 26. So 2,0,2,8,0 centimeters cubed. Now, I'm pretty sure the specifications are in liters, not centimeters cubed, so Help me Google. 20280. 20.28 liters. So I guess that means there's actually a, a thousand cubic centimeters in one liter. Probably should have known that. So is that anywhere even remotely close to the recommendations on Kicker's website? Probably not. I mean, kind of. So their min is 22.7. And their max is 34. So obviously 20.28 liters is less than the minimum. So we're, we're probably gonna have to seal that up, which is kind of a bummer. But um, no, we'll see. This is the part where I become a stubborn idiot and I ignore the manufacturer's suggestions because well, because I'm a stubborn idiot. And then, you know, probably a couple hours from now, I will eventually come to the realization that, hey, the manufacturer was not an idiot and I should have followed their recommendations from the beginning. But, you know, I'm stubborn. Where are my screws for this thing? All right, we're installed, but we got a problem. I miss, I miss a spot, so more silicon. I'll have to let it cure for probably 12 hours before I mess with it again, which is fine, because I got to work anyway. All right, 12 hours of cure time later, and we're back. Went ahead and hooked up the battery tender, because I'm sure I'll be at this for quite a while. I also checked the subwoofer real quick, just to verify that I did get all the leaks around that, that ring, and I did. So we're ready to dial this in. The first order of business is to figure out the tuning frequency of this enclosure. Before I do that, I guess I should, I should just briefly explain what the tuning frequency is. So ported enclosures have something called a tuning frequency. It is essentially the resonant frequency of the subwoofer enclosure itself. And you can, based on how you design this thing, you can change that tuning frequency, which gives you different characteristics out of your subwoofer. So, why do we care about that? Well, a subwoofer enclosure has air inside of it, obviously. When that subwoofer is vibrating back and forth through the amplifier, 
that air inside of that subwoofer enclosure kind of acts as a brake to prevent that diaphragm from going too far in either direction and burning itself out. If your subwoofer is operating frequently below the tuning frequency, it can almost act as if it's a free air subwoofer, which a free air subwoofer is just a subwoofer without an enclosure. If it's operating in a free air environment and it doesn't have that natural braking due to the air inside the subwoofer enclosure, you could burn out your subwoofer. So how do you prevent your subwoofer from burning itself out due to that tuning frequency free air effect that it creates? Well, most amplifiers, including the Kicker Key 501, have something called an infrasonic filter, which is also known as a subsonic filter, also known as a high pass filter. So the gist of it is, is you set your infrasonic filter to a level such that the subwoofer cannot play below that frequency. If it can't play, or if it plays at a reduced volume below that frequency, it could save itself from extending too far in and out, thus saving your subwoofer. So obviously, we got to figure out what that tuning frequency is. Now I looked, I looked all over the internet to try to figure out if BNO published specifications on this subwoofer enclosure and I could not find anything. The only thing I did find was like a little two page white paper where a BNO says, oh, you know, look, look how great we did on the Bronco sound system. And they actually in their diagram, they put the DSP on the wrong side of the Bronco. Worthless marketing nonsense doesn't help us at all. So, we're gonna have to measure it ourselves. How do we measure this, you ask? Well, if we were to graph a um, frequency versus impedance graph, so let's say it has to frequency, and that's gonna be in hertz, and let's do impedance, and that's gonna be in ohms. If you were to make a graph of a subwoofer that plotted frequency against impedance, it would look something like this. Now, this low point, the point at which the impedance is lowest, is actually the tuning frequency of the subwoofer box. Now, once you know the tuning frequency, whatever this point is, say, uh, just for example, let's just say this is 20 hertz. And then here is zero hertz. And then this is probably, uh, I don't know, 150 hertz. Ignore that my scale is just totally screwed up. So anyways, let's pretend our tuning frequency is 20 hertz. Normally you would set your, your filter, your ISF, your subsonic filter, that's what it's called. Normally you would set your subsonic filter to be about a half an octave below the tuning frequency. So if our tuning frequency is 20 hertz, we would want our, our infrasonic filter to be set to 15 hertz. So let's just pretend this is 15 hertz. And that means the infrasonic filter would either reduce or cut off anything lower than this line. Make sense? Good. So now I'm sure the next question you have is, is how do you check the impedance? And the answer to that question is with a piece of test equipment I do not have. So there are devices out there in the market that can measure the impedance of a circuit. Um, there's actually one out there that is specifically made for audio that will produce a frequency, a signal at a given frequency, and it'll read back the impedance of the speaker. But I don't own it. It's like $400 to $600, maybe even $800 nowadays. I haven't looked lately. Uh, I don't wanna pay for it. So uh, instead we're gonna use Ohm's Law and I'm gonna use a multimeter because this thing can measure voltage and current. And if I know the voltage and current, then I can figure out the impedance pretty quickly with math. Lego. Look what the UPS guy just brought me. Just in time for my little project here. Sweet. This, this is a new Fluke 87 multimeter. Ah. I'm sure like, you know, at least 70% of you are like, yeah, I don't really give a crap. Anyway, got a new multimeter. This over here is my Fluke 83. I don't even know how old it is. Probably three or four decades by now. I, I don't, I honestly have no idea. It's been awesome to me. The problem is, is like, look, I can just tap it and it turns on. Tap it again. Like, so 
90% of the time when I go to use this thing, the freaking battery's dead and it's driving me bonkers. So I got an upgrade. But we can use two of these at the same time and do this real quick. So let me get it set up. For those who haven't measured current with a multimeter before, you actually have to you actually have to plug in your multimeter in line with the circuit, which means I gotta disconnect the positive on the speaker or the negative, stick it in a jumper, and then stick the multimeter in between. So got a little jumper, I got these guys. Ooh, these are nice. Ooh, I'm excited. Okay, so you just gotta um well you'll see. Oh, I need the Allen key. Where is the stupid Allen key? All right, so here's the setup. New Fluke, New Fluke is measuring current. He is part of the circuit. Negative probe right here, connected to the speaker. Positive probe over there, connected to the amplifier. Got it? Awesome. Old Fluke down there, Old Fluke is gonna be measuring voltage. Once I know current and voltage, I can get impedance. So I'm gonna build a graph or a chart table, whatever you wanna call it. I'm gonna build a voltage and current chart. Once we know that, we can figure out the impedance. Got it? Cool. I need my phone. Why do we need phone? Phone is going to act as our function generator. Come on, recognize my face, you goober. There you go, function generator. So I can pass in different frequency values in here, place it on the subwoofer, I can figure out what's going on. All right, ignition. Ignition, we are go flight for launch. So we are going to have, we're going to have uh, hertz. We're going to have uh, voltage. We're going to have current. Cool. All right, we're going to start out with everybody. Get out of the way, bug. We're going to start out with everybody's favorite signal, test signal, 1,000 hertz. That that sounds like 1,000 hertz. You're not going to see anything on the subwoofer because 1,000 hertz is way above what the subwoofer is going to play. So let's just cut to the chase. Let's go to 125. There we go. So, at 125, we have 1.193 amps. What's our voltage? Don't know. Where's the negative for this? Oh, that's annoying. 3.107 volts. Okay, now we're going to drop it by 25, so 100. We got 1.596. What's our voltage? Four point one two. Cool. Hopefully you get the gist. I'm gonna rinse repeat all the way down to like twenty hertz or so. Charts filled out. Let's figure out the impedance. So again, we got Ohm's law V equals I Z, which means Z equals V divided by I. So let's calculate it out. Okay, we're all calculated out. You can see we got a peak. We got a peak of six ohms right around 50 hertz. And then we got a low spot of 2.44 at 25 hertz. And then we start going back up again at 20 hertz at 4.28. So, yeah, stupid bug. So our tuning frequency has got to be somewhere in the 25 hertz range. Um, so let's just, let's just plug in some other values. Let's do 24. 26, and then we'll figure out which way we need to go from there. All right, chart's done. Um, 
obviously this is not in any particular order. I'll make a pretty graph in Excel and put it in the video so you can actually see what's going on. But the gist of it is, is that our tuning frequency is right here. That's our loss impedance, 2.44, which means our tuning frequency is around 25 hertz. That's actually pretty low for a subwoofer that size. Hmm. So, so 25 is low. It's not, it's not so low that I think it's a problem. I just don't know if it's, I don't know if it's that low because I'm using a clearly undersized enclosure or if it's that low because B&O designed it that way. I would, I would love to talk to an engineer at B&O that worked on this, but that 25 strikes me as pretty low for an eight inch subwoofer. Interesting. Anyway, just to, just to finish up this thought, if your tuning frequency is 25 Hertz, you want to set your filter to be uh, roughly a half an octave below this tuning frequency. If you read the kicker user manual, they say a full octave, but I prefer a half octave, especially when the tuning frequency is this low, I would not do a full octave below 25. So anyway, half an octave below 25 is roughly 17 to 18 Hertz. That's nine, eight. And that's, that's what, you should set your filter to. Now, how do you do that? I need another piece of cardboard for this. I suppose there's actually three ways now that I think about it. So on the, you know, the case of the Kicker Key 501, they just have a circular knob with a little notch in it and then two points here. And then this is 10 and then this is 40. So obviously if you know this is 10 and this is 40, that means the midpoint on this is 25. And then you can just, you know, continue dividing until you get roughly 18. It's probably gonna be, I don't know, probably roughly here. That's probably gonna be roughly 18, give or take. Another way is just to start playing back 18 Hertz from your, your frequency generator, your phone, whatever you got. And then both visually and audibly look at your subwoofer. Once you start dialing that, that subwoofer, that filter in, you'll notice that the, the volume and the movement of the diaphragm on the subwoofer itself will start lessening. That's when you know your filter's starting to take effect. So you can dial in that way, or you can do it uh, more mathematically. So what, what you would do is you would just play 18 hertz out of your phone and then measure the voltage output on the amplifier itself. And once once you hit the spot, what you'll see is that your voltage curve will do something like this. So once you nail the, the 18 hertz mark on your filter, you'll get a little increase in voltage. And then if you turn it up a little bit higher, you'll notice that it quickly drops. If you turn it up a little bit lower, you'll notice it will start stabilizing. So you know that your filter is set to 18 Hertz once you see that small little increase in voltage. That's probably what I'm gonna do. It's probably what you're gonna have to do if your subwoofer is small like this, honestly. So that's the three ways. I think I'm actually gonna set it to around uh, 23, 24, 25. And the reason for that is, well, okay, so, Anything below 25 or 26 hertz on bass is more of a feeling rather than an auditory thing. You, you feel the bass in your body rather than hearing it through your ears. Like, I'm, I'm just not into that. Like, if I'm doing a three, four hour road trip, I don't wanna be sitting there, I don't, like I don't want my body to be shaking the entire time during that three to four hour road trip. It just sounds exhausting. If that's what you want, like, go for it. You do you, but I don't really want that. Okay. So, next is the low pass filter. Unlike subsonic filters, uh, high pass or low pass filters are very personal opinion sort of things. So, it's kind of up to you where you set it. How I like to think about it is, you know, what are your other speakers doing? Are your other speakers playing only above 100 hertz? If so, maybe your subwoofer needs to play those 100 hertz. If your speakers are playing all the way down to 60, maybe you can turn that that low pass filter down a little bit. It's entirely up to you. The, the only thing I will say is that if you can hear vocals in your subwoofer, 
is probably set too high and you probably need to turn down. But other than that, it's more or less entirely up to you. Um, you know, just within reason, don't set it too high, don't set it too low, play around with it, figure out what you like. Cool, awesome. One thing you can do with low pass filters is you can filter out any problem frequencies. So when I was building this chart earlier, I found a problem frequency. Right around 63 hertz, 60 to 63 hertz, there's something in here that rattles like a freaking banshee. See, listen to this real quick. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's this. It's that. It's the seatbelt. That's stupid. So now that I know that that seatbelt rattle is there, I can potentially block that that frequency off with my low pass filter. I'm not gonna do it yet. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend a few weeks probably listening to the music I normally listen to. If it becomes a problem, then yes, I will I will block it off with the filter. But for now, I'm probably gonna set my, my low pass filter to around 80 Hertz and then see, see where that gets me. Once your filter settings are set, if you have the Kicker Key 501 like I do, um, go ahead and make note of where those filter settings are set, take a picture, whatever you need to do then reset them back to default, so completely open up those filters, and then go run uh, Kicker's Auto Setup. There's instructions in the manual. There's also a video on Kicker's website that I'll link to. It's pretty easy. After you've done the Auto Setup, return your filter settings back to the values that you had them set to before, and you're, you're good to go after that. All right, so I listen to primarily rock and EDM or trance. So let's just give trance a shot since obviously that's going to tax the bass a little bit. This is not real trance, but that's fine. Stance music. Ooh. Ooh. Are these guys clipping? It's kind of hard to tell if they're clipping, to be honest. I don't think they're clipping. Are these guys clipping? No, they sound great. Okay, so those guys sound great. Are these guys clipping? A little bit. I think they're clipping a little bit. But this thing... This sub sounds fantastic. Well, not fantastic, but... It sounds... I mean, considering I didn't use any polyfill or dynamat, it sounds really, really good. All right, we're looking real good, to be honest with you. It's not... It's not 100%. These rear pod, pod speakers do clip at higher volumes. Like, volumes... Volumes that, I, that are so high I would probably never play music at, to be honest with you. And that seatbelt does rattle on a few songs. It's not terrible and you can't hear it from up front, but it's definitely there. Um, so I might have to filter that out on my amplifier. I don't, I don't know yet, especially since I can't hear it up front. The right answer is probably Dynamat, but I just, I just have, I have no desire to do a Dynamat. Dynamat is such a pain. I just, I just don't want to. So not going to do that, but I might filter it out. We'll see. But other than that, like, it's really good. I would, I bet you this rivals a Lux package, a B&O package, maybe even a little bit better, just because you can dial it in to the way that you want. So, like, overall, I'm really happy. Um, just need to tweak a few things here and there, and they'll be good. All right, so here's the plan for the next few weeks. I do want to solve this clipping issue on these rear pod speakers. It's not bad, like I said, but I do want to solve it. I don't think I'm going to use bass blockers because I don't want to lose my mids again. And I really like the way this sounds when it comes to mids at the moment. But there is high pass filter settings on the 204 that I haven't played around with yet. So we'll see what it sounds like. There's not very many settings. I think it's only three settings, maybe four settings. But one of them is the 60 hertz settings. And I think that would be perfect for these rear pods. The only outstanding question is how that will impact the kick panels. And I just don't know. So I'll play around with it. And then the other question is what to do about this subwoofer enclosure, whether I want it sealed or ported. So I think I'm just going to drive around and A-B it back and forth to figure out which I like better, see what it sounds like at higher volumes and all that stuff. 
you can reach the port pretty easily with it mounted in there. So I can just stuff a towel on the port to give me a sealed enclosure and we'll see what it sounds like. Either way, for both of these, I'll let you guys know in the future video what I end up doing. So that's it for now. I'm gonna start putting these trim panels back, which is awesome, so I'm tired of them. And then next on the list for me is these guys. I got some heretic lights that need to be installed. So stick around if you wanna see that. It should be a lot of fun. It's gonna be awesome. As usual, if you got any questions, comments, words of praise, RegnerCon, Bronco Nation, Bronco 6G, feel free to reach out. That's it, I'm gone. Adios, guys. All right, it's burrito time, Woohoo! All right, so here's the plan for the next few weeks. Or oh, shut up. Holy crap, you are freaking loud. Ugh. I'm gonna chuck a rock at you if you don't shut up. You stupid bird. Where are you? Stop. You are lucky that you're in the, the tree closest to the Bronco and I'm afraid this is gonna hit my Bronco if I chuck it at you. But quiet. Yeah, go away. Get out of here. Stupid birds, Jesus. What the heck are they even talking to?